Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Facing the Climate Emergency, featuring Margaret Klein Salomon. Margaret Klein Salomon, PhD, is a clinical psychologist turned climate warrior whose work helps people to face the deeply frightening, painful truths of climate change and transform their despair into effective action. She is the founding director of the Climate Mobilization and Climate Mobilization Project. Their mission is to initiate an emergency speed, all hands on deck mobilization to protect humanity and the natural world from climate catastrophe. Professor Salomon and I spoke on August 27th about her new book, Facing the Climate Emergency. The climate emergency has been so intellectualized and and denied and and uh, silenced that it 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 really hasn't been integrated for people it's it's you know it's not a part of them they they try to keep it separate and so so really um, that's that takes energy all the time to try and not think about the climate emergency to try and keep it separate, um, keep it out of your mind. And yeah, it, it hurts. I have been doing this work. I've been in emergency mode for the past seven years. Uh, so, so seven years ago, I recognized that, I mean, this was an existential emergency. Civilization was going to collapse. We need World War II scale climate mobilization. I left my job, right? And even I have been surprised at how quickly we are moving, racing towards collapse. I, I mean, I, I, I thought we had more time. And I, yeah, and it's, I, was, I was still, you know, 10 out of 10 maxed out fear and commitment. So it's, I mean, it's really, our situation is just shocking. The, the, the combination of ecological uh, degradation and, and peril, the, the just absolute existential threats that we are creating and digging ourselves in deeper to, and that contrasted with the just total failure of our institutions, our uh, governments, our, but also our universities, the media, uh, religious institutions, corporations, right? Even environmental organizations, just like it, almost no one is treating this with the urgency that it requires, which is the same level of urgency as though your house were actually on fire, as Greta would say. Yeah, you mention in the book that uh, it hasn't been, you know, just government and the media, but also some of the green groups and climate scientists have been seemingly afraid to talk about the scope of the crisis uh, for fear of scaring people. But then you also say in the book that that fear of scaring people is not helping us. Uh, Yeah, I consider... That idea that, uh, you know, quote, fear doesn't work as a motivator. We, as the climate movement, can't scare people. I consider that one of the worst ideas in the world. Um, And I think it has truly held the movement back for decades. Um, And uh, yeah, it's fear is a self-protective mechanism. It is there for a reason. If if someone told you that they were afraid of someone in their household or someone they were dating, you would not say, oh, no, 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 don't be afraid. Fear doesn't work. Whatever. You would react. We're, we're afraid because we're in danger. So I, I just the 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 level of um, 
just backwards thinking on this because because then the other problem is with fear doesn't work logic is reality is at this moment in history is inherently terrifying i mean if yeah, assuming you want to live i mean assuming you don't want to be alive during the collapse of civilization i mean this is it's just it's devastates devastating so how could so but if you decide in advance that fear doesn't work as a motivator what do you do when the, when you got this kind of truth on your hands and and the answer is you euphemize you uh you use that you look at the uh, only the opportunities and the bright sides right we're going to create so many jobs this is going to be great um but and or, or or uh you know you say oh it's not it's not as bad as some of those alarmists say um and yeah i mean the 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 climate movement and and uh you know the ipcc in in so many ways has just and the, and the, i should mention the democratic party they just in so many ways um understate the the scale and urgency of this situation which again could not be greater yeah, you talk about the importance of entering emergency mode, and you used that earlier uh, when you were talking just now, uh, to understand and enter emergency mode as being one of the steps that we all need to take. And I liked the fact that you made a distinction uh, between emergency mode and panic mode. So I thought maybe you could just talk for a moment about what you meant by that. When a healthy adult right is is confronted with a life-threatening emergency such as a fire in their house or a, a cancer diagnosis or uh, that they will enter emergency mode they will redirect their focus and their resources and their priorities in order to protect themselves they you know it's like stop what you're doing we have we have a crisis on our hands this is this is a uh, this is not normal times this is yeah i mean that like like if, if you imagine if your house is on fire it, it doesn't matter what you were doing 10 minutes ago no matter how important it was, you know, doing an important business deal or, you know, uh, proposing marriage or whatever, right? It doesn't matter because the house is on fire and that comes first. So emergency mode is a, a type of engagement that people can, uh, can enter now for this collective threat. That, that threatens us all, we can, we can uh, by working together through a social movement, uh, the climate emergency movement, uh, we can, and the and, uh, climate justice movement, we can uh, potentially uh, cancel the apocalypse and protect, protect humanity in the living world and create a, a better uh a better world for everyone. Yeah, and you really definitely focus too on the importance of being part of a movement and you warn against uh, believing that mere individual choices in lifestyle are going to be enough to make a difference at this point. Right. I think it is, I think it is truly telling that Beyond Petroleum in, invested millions of dollars of ads about people's carbon footprints and popularizing the idea of the carbon footprint and uh, just setting the stage for blaming people. This is your fault. You are doing this because of your greedy consumption. And, you know, that's that's where you need to focus. You need to purify yourself. And, uh, you know, that's that's fine. I, I do some of that stuff. You know, I'll, almost everyone in the climate movement is doing some kind of 
you know, vegetarianism or biking or, you know, or we, once you once you understand the climate emergency, it, it's that stuff doesn't feel good. Uh, you know, go whatever. Uh, go going on cruises or flying or driving, you know, so so. I adopting a, a whatever a greener lifestyle is fine and maybe even good, but it's not politics and it will not protect humanity and the living world. Only, only transformative, a transformative social movement can do that. So, so I just, I think it's really important as, as we enter emergency mode, you know, it's not, it's not. Okay. So I, this is, this circles back to your former question, right? About, about differentiating it from panic mode. Okay. When a child is faced by an emergency, such as a fire in their house, they generally go into panic mode and, and, you know, shut down their functioning gets worse while the adult will go into a kind of, you know, hyper-focused level of functioning. The child, you know, sometimes, sometimes children hide in closets during, during fires, right? They kind of break down. Um, and so that's panic mode, right? That's when you, when you become so overwhelmed by terror that you lose your reflective, uh, strategic, rational functioning, right? So we can't, we can't do that. We have to um, feel our fear and let it motivate us into taking the most strategic action possible. We can't just, you know, go, 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 act, act, act. We need to be very thoughtful and, and not just once, but in, a, in an ongoing way. Uh, think, you know, what is what is the most effective uh, way for me to contribute to this at this at this point? Yeah. And I appreciated, too, that you talked about you, you uh, you also as a way of ex explaining what emergency mode was, you contrasted it with normal mode. And you compared different things. And one of them was the self-esteem source for the individual. So in the normal mode that we have had, at least up until COVID, uh, you know, one would get one's self-esteem in our society through individual accomplishment. And then you're saying that in emergency mode, something like that would change. And your self-esteem source instead would be how you are contributing to the solution. And this is something I haven't really seen many other people talk about, you know, which is how all of this relates to the to the ego, you know? Yeah. What does it mean to be a good person? Uh, and, and what and what should we value and and admire people for? Um, and if you look at uh, times of, in emergency modes, such as World War Two, the people, the people who were most admired, the people who you know, felt, really felt good about themselves, were the were the people who were uh, leading both on the on the front lines and also uh, in the war effort. Um, you know, producing war material uh, in converted factories and uh, you know developing new methods of how to build ships as fast as possible and and whatnot. I mean, this is like. It, 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 it actually, people, people think of a uh, climate emergency and they think, oh, I'm going to have to give so much up. I'm going to lose so much here. And it's like, actually, it feels great to be a part of an overriding national mission. And in this case, even a global mission hopefully. And, and that, you know, America has gotten so narcissistic is like, it, it, it sucks to live just for yourself and, and your own achievements and, and gratification. It, it feels so much better to dedicate yourself to something greater than yourself and take and, and, and use your contribution as your benchmark for success. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, it's just some, for for me personally, it's it's been a transformative thing. I, I mean, as I as I write in my book, I I would describe myself as previously as somewhat like insecure, you know, just 
whatever, focused on myself and my flaws or whatnot. And, um, and that's, it's just a really uh, myopic, uh, view. And I'm so much, so much happier, uh, and more fulfilled, uh, feeling like, I know I'm here on this planet and it is to do everything that I can to protect humanity in the living world. And, you know, at all, whatever the things I used to worry about are just feel irrelevant now. It's definitely inspiring to hear about that transformation. And I think that that kind of positive message about, uh, that that's not focused on what one's giving up, but, but what, uh, what what you know what 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 beauty and gratification exists in living a different way is a really great thing to focus on and i you also uh um talk about how for a lot of people that's going to mean working through uh some pain or something you know first you say this is a self-help book but its goal is not to make you feel less pain the goal is to make you feel your pain more directly and constructively to turn it into action that protects humanity and all of life so there we're seeing pain not as a negative thing but merely as a uh, signal that's telling you that something needs to change absolutely i i mean the idea that like we should we shouldn't feel any kind of painful feelings i mean it's just like it's ridiculous in any kind of circumstance i mean that we're human we like we feel emotions all day every day like it's it's just a critical part of how we process information and and live in the world uh and and you know we're talking about losing everything that is what's on that's what that's what's on the table that's that's what we are barreling towards is is everyone losing everything and of course we're gonna have an emotional reaction to that i i I, like it and of course it's of course it's incredibly painful it's the the pain it i mean the question is not like yeah do you want to feel pain or not the question is do you want to live in reality I mean, and I guess for some people, maybe not. It's just, you know, do uh, QAnon or something, right? Just like give your give your brain over to a uh, conspiracy theory or to um, what a extremist political ideology, you know, white supremacists or, you know, Trump voters, right? You know, that's that's one that's one approach uh, or you could just try and like block it out as much as possible and just like you know just say to yourself like oh things are normal things are fine things are fine things are normal things are normal right all the time um or uh you can look at the reality as it actually lives as it actually exists in in on this planet and and uh look at that from a from a personal from a spiritual from an emotional perspective uh, and, and really, you know, let it, let it change you. Re- it, like reality isn't what we thought it was. I mean, I, growing up, I was told, uh, you know, the future is bright. Uh, you know, you can, we're, we're making progress in all kinds of ways and, uh, and you can, you can, you know, make your own destiny, right. Be who you want to be. Uh, and it was, it was not true. I, I, I have to, you know, deliver the bad news that, uh, the future is incredibly grim. And if we, and so we need to, <laughs> we need to stop walking off this cliff, right. We have to, um, yeah, integrate, integrate the knowledge into, who we are and yeah, grieve the future you thought you had. And that that allows a space an opening for something else to emerge. Yeah. I think that, you know, many of us who are activists have been thinking about all of this for, for a long time and for years and wondering what it will take to snap people out of their spell and it does seem as though 2020 actually has been doing that for more people 
uh, do maybe first and foremost to, to COVID, but then secondly, the Black Lives Movement has really also been bringing things to people's mind in an undeniable way. Um, I, I feel like both of these are showing us that um, uh, reality can intrude on people's uh, fantasies. Normal mode, uh, I, I think, is over forever. Um I mean, obviously with coronavirus, where it's very, very strange times, but, uh, and then obviously California is on fire and, uh, the Gulf coast is getting hammered by hurricane, uh, Laura as we speak. Um, I mean, this is, this is not going away. This is accelerating. And can we... I mean, I think the real question is just, can we pull it together to face reality and, I mean, just take power, build power? I I mean, it it looks so grim, you know, politically, uh, like our leadership is so, uh, I mean, obviously our uh, Republican leadership is... uh, just totally uh off the rails horrible but the but the democratic leadership is also uh pathetic and uh so so it's it's you know the situation is yeah it's dire but but are i mean are we gonna are we gonna do our best to try and change it uh, that's that's kind of the question at hand i think in a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... Yeah, and I think that, that this year has been really illustrative of of uh, people power in a way because, you know, you look at like the Black Lives Matter movement and the explosion in activity that's taken place since the George Floyd murder in Minneapolis and how that movement didn't just come up for a weekend and then go away, but it's continuing, you know, and, you know, today it was announced that the uh, the NBA, the players decided to strike rather than play the games for their for the playoffs, yeah. you know, because of the recent murder in in in, in Kenosha. So, um, and those things are happening despite the entrenched uh, racism and racist policies of both the Republicans and the Democratic parties, you know, and they're forcing their own, they're they're forcing they're forcing the conversation to change on its own because. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans really feel like changing the status quo at all. But here's a movement that's saying, no, we do have to change the status quo. And we're going to make some noise and, until you until you pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. No, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is, uh, you know, an incredible example of courage and, and dedication and emergency mode. Right. This is not. In normal mode, you play basketball games. In emergency mode, no. Something else is more important. And, yeah, I, I think that what we what we really uh, need to achieve, it's, it's challenging, but it's, you know, it's what we've got to do, but is achieve, a, like, a movement of movements, right, that, that understands that um, this uh, system that we've constructed for ourselves and been living in is it's, it's done. It's, it's absolutely in its last gasps and we need to build something new and at, at emergency speed. And that, that is not just about infrastructure. Um, and, but though it, though I mean, there's plenty to be done on infrastructure, but, but it's a, we're really, we're really talking about transforming everything, right? We're talking about, transforming our energy system and agricultural system, right? What we eat, how we get, move around in the world, transportation, uh, 
you know, the electrical grid, uh, how information is shared, right? Everything. And we're all, and in order to do that, in order to make that possible, we need, we need a transformation of our like governance and, and yeah, policing and yeah, how we, how we relate to each other, right? We, we, we really do need to change everything and it is daunting and there are many, many obstacles and challenges, but I, I mean, what else are we going to be spending our, our final hours on? I mean, this is it people like, yeah. Now, now or never. I feel like the young people really understand this too, especially the young activists out on the street. On on this podcast, I interviewed uh, a 30 year old woman from Minneapolis who's been involved in the George Floyd protests there, and she understood clearly the relationship between the bad policing and between, say, militarism and also the environment. And then I spoke with a tree sitter who I think was 20 uh, in Northern California who uh, saw the connections between what she was doing sitting in a tree and her friends who were protesting on the street in these other cities. And so I feel some hope looking at those young people because, well, I'm a Gen Xer. I was born in 69, and I don't feel like people my age are making those same connections as the young people are. And so really part of me feels like one of the best things that middle-aged and older people can do is get out of the way. Yeah, I mean, I I certainly agree that young people are bringing a new level of, of passion and emergency mode and dedication and uh yeah whatever intersectional thinking or you know big picture thinking uh to this work and it is absolutely a breath of fresh air and and i'll i'll, I'll say that that came they the, in order to achieve that they had to the young young people i mean the climate strikers and the sunrise movement and extinction rebellion had to not listen to uh, uh, conventional wisdom, right? Of don't don't scare people, kind of keep it keep it uh, optimistic all, at all times. Whatever they had to say, uh, no, no, and and we're not and we're not advocating for a carbon tax either. We're not going for these little steps. And gradualism is done. We're going for a you know a vision of a new society, a green new deal, and. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I don't, I mean, I think everyone has a role to play. So I don't, I don't love the idea of getting out of the way. Um, but I do think, you know, taking leadership from, uh, young people is, a, you know, it's a good idea. That's how I convinced my parents to vote for Bernie Sanders. I said, I said, all all three of your children are are voting for Bernie Sanders. All like, you know, twelve of your nieces and nephews are doing so. Like, stand with the younger generation. It's a good, good argument. But I mean, really, it's like I do, I do think there is a element, a strong generational element here, and I do think young people need to confront the older generation in their in their own lives you know their parents their teachers their uh whatever soccer coaches and and like and and family and it's like what you know what are you doing to protect me from this i i, I think i think a lot of children feel really betrayed um that that their parents won't or can't seemingly uh protect them and i and i think taking you know showing your showing your kids that you are doing what you can to be a part of this um to be a part of this movement and try to try to prevent this i i think is um yeah it's really important I mean, I've, I've personally found it gratifying to look to the young people for, for the inspiration and to listen to the things that they're saying. And when faced with an idea that doesn't immediately make sense to me, 
to be like, oh, you know what? It doesn't actually have to make sense to me either. I can just look at what's happening and I can understand that this is how change happens, is that youth brings change. And I can then uh, see that as an opportunity to be like, okay, uh, I can give up the burden of having to, to be in the driver's seat all the time or give up the burden of thinking I should be in the driver's seat and say, well, look, this is where, you know, they, they have a better understanding of uh, the system, I think, in some ways, because they haven't benefited from it in the same mm. way that the older people do. I mean, my parents who are about 80, they benefited from the system their whole lives, you know. But, you know, uh, I, I benefited less. And then the people I know who are in their 20s and 30s have benefited hardly at all. You know, they're like drowning in debt. They can't afford rent. There aren't any jobs. I mean, so obviously people who are not benefiting from normal, I think, are just more likely to have criticisms for it and are more likely, you know, because they're seeing it more clearly, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they're also more in emergency mode. I mean, they this is you know, they're fighting for their, their lives and, and many of them know it, uh, which is, you know, I like the historical example of ACT UP, the uh, AIDS movement in the 1980s and 90s. And, and they, yeah, I mean, gay, gay men in, in New York City and, and San Francisco, but were, were uh, like dropping like flies. I mean, it was it was a true emergency and act up uh founded by larry kramer um brought in energy i mean there were there were there were nonprofits, there were organizations operating in the space but they were doing things like you know helping people who had aids with uh medical help or social work or uh but but what what act up did is uh bring the the emotion i mean bring that bring the anger and the and the terror because and and uh you know act up and its members felt and correctly that they were fighting for their lives and the lives of their friends and that that uh feeling leads to a certain type of tactic certain type of communication uh that that demonstrates it's it, it shouts from the rooftops that that this is an emergency, that people are dying, and that uh, we we need we need to solve this. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember ACT UP, and they were they were definitely very inspirational, and they did make a difference. And you know, their catchphrase was "Silence equals death." Yes. So silence equals death. There we are, not holding back at all. You know. So um, one thing I noticed in your book was that you um, didn't really mention specific. Uh, solutions. You talked about the need to get involved in the solutions, which obviously people do, and you didn't mention specific ones. And I was kind of assuming that that was intentional. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Yeah, just um, you didn't like like for example, um, you you pointed out correctly that we we uh, reducing our carbon isn't enough. We actually also have to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Yes, you know, yes. so there's lots of things to do to reduce the carbon and lots of things to remove it. But you didn't sp mention anything in particular, and so I thought that was probably um, a specific choice that you made not to mention anything in particular. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm a psychologist, and climate is and and that 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 seven years ago became a, a climate person but climate is such a huge uh that it covers such huge swaths of of uh knowledge I, I mean we're talking about uh science and you know psychology and social psychology and how social movements function and how power works and you know political economy and uh then the technology side uh and and agriculture and all that and so anyway i try to i try to stay in my lane when possible um but but yeah i mean i'm i'm so and i i, I never feel like i'm in a position to evaluate uh various technologies um but uh, my understanding of is that uh, regenerative agriculture and uh, rewilding, uh, you know, adding vegetation, this is a great carbon sink, um, that there's other kind of carbon farming approaches like biochar. And I'm also not categorically against the, uh, you know, direct air capture 
um, machines. I, I hope, in, in fact, that there'll be really, you know, great uh, machines at removing carbon from the atmosphere. I, I think that I, I don't want to rely on them. I think that would be um, suicidal. But I, some, some environmentalists uh, are, are very uh, kind of categorical or like, yeah, draw a bright line there. But I, I, my, my opinion about technology is um, we are just so uh, far off this cliff that um, I'm, I'm open to miracles, technological <laughs> miracles. Right. <laughs> I mean, they can happen from time to time, you know? <laughs> they do. They do happen. They do. And I, they and they especially happen when the government is funding research. And and universities and knowledge-making uh, institutions are actually focused on this. I mean, I, I really believe in human brilliance. I mean, I, I believe in, yeah, that we're a, 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 like a great, great species and that we... Uh, yeah, that we move forward. We are capable of growth and moving forward. And, but when you look at how we're using our brilliance, you know, it's a going into, um, the, you know, the next iPhone, the next app, uh, financial, uh, you know, schemes for it to, to, to create more profit. I, I mean, and, and like, what are universities researching, you know, all kinds of stuff and it's, you know, worthwhile stuff, but again, emergency mode, we need, we need to utilize, uh, you know, whatever our best and brightest and, uh, and everyone as much as they can, we need to utilize, you know, all everything that's everything that's great about ourselves and, and humanity in order to, in order to, in order to win definitely to have a chance at winning mm -hmm. yeah no to have to even have a chance yeah definitely um i think that one thing um that you didn't talk about very much in in the book about but i think is worth, is worth mentioning is that i think that there's um uh an indigenous perspective to all of this as well that we westerners and people in the technological societies could learn from too and i remember in the 90s there was um an indigenous conference that the United Nations had. And I will always remember this quotation I heard from this woman who got up and spoke and she was from, uh, you know, what we would call a primitive, you know, tribe somewhere. And she said, you know, we, you know, first peoples or however she was that she said it, we compromise only about 1% of the world's population, human population, but 99% of the wisdom that's needed for how to live sustainably on the planet. And I was kind of wondering how much of that you've, you've looked at or have been inspired by yourself. Yeah, well, I think that uh, Standing Rock, um, the, the indigenous protests against uh, the pipeline at Standing Rock were, um, was a turning point in the climate movement. I, I think uh, they demonstrated a level of... Uh, courage and dedication and and like mission over self um that was that was really new and that inspired a huge amount of support um and and uh and and engagement and and uh it kind of set a new bar um so i think yeah i, th I think that um that was extremely exciting i think yeah i mean i i i'm very interested in what you're talking about as well i mean just like how yeah how can we learn yeah we yeah it's it's i mean that's like a kind of technology right uh wisdom indigenous wisdom that that yeah i, I mean we need we need to learn from as much as possible right yeah and i was i was reminded of this too when you uh early on in your book uh there was a quote you said we sense we're in a climate emergency but we have a deep-seated psychological instinct to defend against that knowledge and when i read that i was like i'm not sure i i, I wonder about this question a lot about whether that uh that urge to sort of turn away if if that's instinctual in us and humans or if that's an enculturated thing from the the civilized places and the civilized cultures because i mm. feel like i feel like from an indigenous perspective that they would not be um 
it would not be instinctual for them to defend against the knowledge that things are falling apart, but rather to see it and to be facing it, you know? Uh, yeah, I don't, um, I certainly know a few indigenous leaders who would absolutely fit the description that, that you said. I mean, they are, they are, uh, you know, eyes wide open and, and really, uh, dedicated yeah i mean just single single-minded clearly in emergency mode and uh yeah i i don't i i don't feel like i can really speak more broadly than that i i just um yeah i think it i i think it is a really promising and important source of knowledge yeah, no, definitely. I, I, I've, I've been living in the West for the last 20 years, and I've been involved with some of the rewilding and wild, ten, and wild tending um, scenes out here. And so I've had an opportunity to meet and hear from indigenous people that way. And so that's where a lot of my perspective has come, has come from that, uh, because in the West, there still actually are some intact uh, cultures going on here that you can that you can um that you can interact with in, in a way that you can't quite as easily, um, you know, back East, you know, but, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of, and, and I've been wondering, I mean, it's, it's, that's, it's that whole what's human nature thing. And that's, that's a bigger discussion that we can have today, but I feel like, I feel like denialism is part of the Western worldview. And that's partly how we got here was why was by denying every step of the way that we were going the wrong way. If you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I uh, don't feel uh, expert enough to comment, but I, I definitely hear what you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate you spending some time talking to me today, Professor Solomon. I was wondering, uh, maybe you could, uh, is there something that you wanted to end on here? Uh, and that could also include just where to, to find your book or where to find out more about what you're doing. Uh, yes, please. Um, I would love to invite readers to go to facingtheclimateemergency.com where you can download the first chapter of the book and uh, see if that's, if it's, uh, the, you know, the thing for you, um, my organization, the climate mobilization, uh, at the, the climate mobilization.org is, you know, based on the kind of understanding principles that, uh, I've talked about today and are trying to lead the, lead the country into emergency mode. Um, so love to see you there as well. Um, thank you so much for having me and for, and for reading, uh, reading the book. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.